Hey gang, this is Rip. This week I am on site in Black Mountain, North Carolina, about 20 miles outside of Asheville, North Carolina. I am here for the ninth annual Camp Plant Stock event. It's going to be a barn burner of a, of a weekend. This location may possibly be one of the most gorgeous places in the Northeast United States. It sits at about 3,000 feet of elevation. It is so foresty. It's loaded with rhododendron and ferns and pine trees. There is a raging stream that bifurcates at the top of the property and slices through the campus. It is really nothing short of magical. I want you to know that we will be returning to our regularly scheduled programming of the podcast very soon. But in the meantime, I want to bring you this lecture from the 2018 plant stock stage. This individual kills it. Uh, he will be returning in 2020 talking about his new book that everybody is going to want a copy of. Okay, with that, let me say, let's just take it straight to the stage of Plant Stock 2018. The next man up is a man, he has turned into a supernova. I mean, this guy is on fire. If he was any hotter, he would self-ignite. Uh, I'd have to take that fire extinguisher down there and put him out. Um, he has been on a roll for a long time, but he has just like come into his own like nobody's business. Uh, this is a man that was um, one of the founders of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine in 2004. As you guys all know, he is MrNutritionFacts.org that he started in 2011. How many of you subscribe to Nutrition Facts? All right. I mean, every day it's another blog, it's another video. I mean, this guy, does he ever sleep, right? How Not to Die. I think How Not to Die is going to become the next China study. And the China study has oversold over 2 million copies. He's also got the How Not to Die cookbook. Uh, it is like crazy. I mean, New York Times bestselling author, physician, international speaker. This guy is in high demand. And he was nice enough to come to Plant Stock this year. When I asked him, when I, uh, when I asked him, I said, Michael, I go, what's your favorite movie? And he said, Rip, who's got time for movies? There's lives to be saved here. <laughs> but, but he's going to drop a hint during his talk because he does have a favorite movie and see if you can pick it up. Michael, bring it up. Let's put it to the test. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Allow me to begin on a personal note. <laughs> this is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. Sure, I did so many bypass surgeries, I basically ran out of plumbing at some point, could find a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people, like Francis Greger, my grandmother arrived at one of Pritikin's early sessions in a wheelchair. Mrs. Gregor had heart disease, angina, claudication, her condition so bad, she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. There's a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding, 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96, 
to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Years later, um, Dr. Dean Ornish publishes a landmark lifestyle heart trial proving with something called quantitative angiography that did he, indeed heart disease could be reversed. Arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and lifestyle program. Uh, when this ha I mean, I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. So wait a second, if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world so busy folks like you don't have to. Very nice. I then compile the most interesting, most groundbreaking, most practical findings to new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads. No corporate sponsorship, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. <laughs> okay, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important advances in health, according to one of our most uh, prestigious uh, medical figures of the last century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that many of our major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African uh, population of Uganda, for example, coronary artery disease is almost non-existent. Oh, wait a second. Our number one killer almost non-existent? What were they eating? They were eating lots of vegetables and grains and green leafy vegetables taken by all, even at breakfast, kale. <clears throat> Um, and their protein almost entirely from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in kind of modern day plant eaters. Wait a second, maybe they were just dying early from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Uh, 632 autopsies, Uganda only one myocardial infarction, uh, 632 age and gender uh, matched autopsies in Missouri, 136, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back to another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,420, less than one in 1,000, whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Atherosclerosis. Hardening of the arteries is a disease that begins in childhood by age 10. <laughs> Nearly all kids raised in the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks building up inside of their arteries, the first stage of the disease. These streaks then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. In our heart, cause a heart attack in our brain, the same disease process, and cause a stroke. So if there's anyone here today, right, older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have, whether you know it or not. But is that even possible? You know, researchers, researchers took people with heart disease, put them on a kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that do not get epidemic heart disease or hope, say maybe we could slow the disease down or something, maybe even stop it. Instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving the, some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery. Uh, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, 
but we're just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement in blood flow in the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. And the best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table, right? You get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally. If you just stand back, let your body work its magic, right? Uh, but what if you hit your shin in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. <laughs> you, you'd never heal. You'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. They'd be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. Right? You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Still really hurts like heck, but oh, I feel so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. Right? It's like, uh, you know, I mean, our body wants to come back to health if we let it. But if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. You know, it's like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within 15 years of stopping smoking, our lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Our lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if we never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham, first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stand back, get out of the way, stop re-damaging ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. The human body, is a self-healing machine. Right? Sure, you can choose moderation, hit yourself with a smaller hammer. <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all? Right? Look, it's, each up. it's up to each of us to make our own decisions about what to eat and how to live. But we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Look, this is nothing new. Uh, look, American Heart Journal, 1977, cases like Mr. F.W. here. Heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. Few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. All right. Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. It costs thousands of dollars a year, but hey, at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> it does not look like uh, those uh, following the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper. They can work better because you're treating the underlying cause of the disease. At certain point, like, what more do we need to know? I mean, there's only one diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, right? So anytime someone tries to sell you on some new diet they heard about, do me a favor. Ask them a simple question. Where you say, wait, has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, the number one reason me and all my loved ones will die? Uh, if the answer is no, why would you even consider it? Right? I mean, if that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet until proven otherwise? Uh, and the fact that it can also be a self-effective preventing, arresting, or reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Let me just uh, touch on those two cases. Well, we've known uh, that you can reverse diabetes with a plant-based diet for, since the 1930s, where a small group of diabetics were placed on uh, a variety of a plant-based diet. Um, and in a period of five years, a quarter of them were able to get off their insulin altogether. You say, yeah, 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 but plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets. So maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you'd have to do is put people on a, on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Right? Then we could see if there's some unique benefits to plant-based eating beyond just all the easy weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. 
subjects are weighed every day. If they started to lose weight, they're made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, some of the participants have problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Oh. <laughs> but eventually they adapted. So no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was there still any benefit to their diabetes? Well, um, di um, insulin uh, dose was cut 60% across the board. Half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow. How many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking about diabetics who've had diabetes for as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years, then off all insulin in less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. For decades, they were just 13 days away at any time. Here's participant number 15. Um, 32 units of insulin on the control diet, then 18 days later on none. Better blood sugars on 32 units less insulin. That's the power of plants. Right? And remember, this was with zero weight loss. His body just started working that much better. What about the side effects? Oh, how about cholesterol's dropping like a rock to under 150? Um, as a nice little side benefit, again, only in a matter of weeks. So just like people asking people to make modest changes in their diet will net you modest benefits in terms of cholesterol reduction, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Right? <laughs> Everything in moderation is a truer statement than many people realize. Right? Asking our diabetic patients to make you know, moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, <laughs> moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. <laughs> Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. You know, there was this uh, famous study published in a journal called Cell Metabolism, which purported to show that diets high meat, eggs, dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking, suggesting that people in middle age who eat a lot of meat, eggs, or dairy four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. If you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein during middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. The academic institution where the study was done sent out a press release um, with a memorable opening line, uh, that chicken wing reading could be as deadly as a cigarette. Um, explain that, look, quadrupling one's risk of cancer, I mean, that's comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes, right? Um, so what was the response in the scientific community to this revelation that diets high meat, eggs, dairy could be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother coating smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me. <laughs> so let's not tell it. Shh. That reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer, or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, multiplying your risk sixfold. If you eat lots of meat and dairy, so they conclude, Let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risk of secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. <laughs> That's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot, oh, so much worse. <laughs> uh, how about neither? Two risks, don't make a right. <laughs> of course, you'll note Philip Morris stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <laughs> Just saying. <clears throat> 
All right, let me skip down um, a high blood pressure here. 78 million Americans affected. Um, that's about one in three American adults. And as we get older, our pressures get higher and higher. Such about by age 60, the majority of us have hypertension. So wait a second, if most of us get high blood pressure when we get older, maybe it's less a disease, more just a natural, inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. A thousand people in rural Kenya um, had their blood pressures me measured. A typical Kenyan diet, something like this. Lots of uh, you know, corn and beans, vegetables, fruit, greens. There's the G word again. Um, uh, our pressures uh, go up as we age, such as by age 60, we're hypertensive. Their pressures go down. And the lower, the better. We now have evidence, even people under, 120 over 80 may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. Is it even possible to get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible. It's normal living a healthy enough life. Three years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. Um, uh, how many uh, cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow, they must have low rates of uh, heart disease, right? No, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of atherosclerosis, our number one killer was found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70, their entire life, 70-year-olds, the same blood pressure as 16-year-olds. So wait a second, African diet, Asian diet, I mean, vastly different diets. What they shared in common is that they were eating plant-based day to day, with meat only eaten on special occasions. And you say, wait a second, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diet that was so protective? Because in the Western world, the only folks getting it down that low, on average, were those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in at an average of about 110 over 65. Here's the largest uh, study of plant-based eaters to date, the Adventist II study that looked at, at 89,000 folks, comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians um, uh, who, don't, who eat meat about once a week, um, uh, uh, but certainly not every day, to, uh, compared to pesco vegetarians, those who eat no meat except fish, compared to those who eat no meat at all, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. This was an Adventist study. So even the non-vegetarians weren't eating a lot of meat, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, tended to exercise a lot, not smoke. This is a really healthy cohort of meat eaters, but still found this stepwise drop um, in high blood pressure rates. The more and more plant-based people tend to eat, same thing with diabetes, same thing with obesity. Right? So sure, you can throw the vast majority of risk out the window, by eating plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along this spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefits. You can show this experimentally. You take uh, vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, uh, um, uh, cut meat out of the diet, their blood pressures go down within seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications they had to. I mean, you can't, I mean, you can't treat the clot and be on multiple blood pressure medications. Your pressures would drop too low, right? You get dangerous, fall over, get dizzy, right? Hurt yourself, right? So lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. Right? So. Uh, does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? Uh, no, they recommend this low-meat diet, so-called DASH diet. So well, wait a second, when this DASH diet was being created, I mean, were they just not aware of this landmark data uh, by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with a number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a more plant-based diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. Right? They didn't think the public could handle the truth. Right? Now, look, I recently talked at Harvard, where um, Frank Sachs was still there, um, and, you know, I, and I tried to be sympathetic and said, look, I understand, right? Look, just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, 
diets never work unless you actually eat them. So, you know, they're thinking, hey, look, how many people are going to go strictly plant-based, right? If we soft pedal the message, we come up with some kind of compromised diet, well, then on a population scale, we may do more good in the world. Okay. So I asked them, okay, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. And the truth is that most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition. According to the Goldberg disease study, this is the largest study ever of disease risk factors in human history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The number one cause of death in these United States, it's our diet. The number one cause of disability in the United States, it's our diet. Now bumping cigarettes to number two. Tobacco now only kills about a half million Americans every year, um, where our, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. Right? So if most deaths are preventable related to nutrition, right? if a diet is the number one cause of death and disability, then obviously right, nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it's the number one thing your doctors talked about at every single visit ever, right? So we saying, how can there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. You know, back in the 50s. The average per capita cigarette consumption, 4,000 cigarettes a year. I mean, the average person walking around smoked half pack a day, on average. The media was telling you to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. <laughs> I mean, look, you want to keep fit and stay slender, so you make sure to smoke. Uh, oh, we need lots of hot dogs to stay trim. We need lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? <laughs> Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for youth. They want to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative powers claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better be safe than sorry and smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. No woman ever says, no, they're so around, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> I mean, after all, John Wayne smoked them until they got lung cancer and died. You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and... So were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Sure, you know, some doctors smoke camels, you know, but others uh, preferred Lucky. So there was a little disagreement there. The leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Maybe in Flint, Michigan. <coughs> But don't worry, if your throat does get a little irritated, your doctor can, can always write your prescription for cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Right? So when the AMA is saying smoking is good for you, not just neutral, but actually good for you, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive science, that is, um, while he still could speak, before he died from throat cancer. You know, by some miracle back then, there was some smokingfacts.org website that could 
deliver the science directly bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would become aware of studies like this. This is an Adventist study out of California in 1958 showing that non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first. And when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored off the face of the earth, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society, right? It was on the movies, airplanes, right? Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. Right? All right, well, let's go back to our thought experiment then, right? So if you're a smoker in the 50s, in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit, uh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, uh, you could have cancer by then. If you wait until the Surgeon General, um, uh, uh, the powers that be say stop smoking, you could be dead by then. It took more than seven thousand studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You'd think maybe after the first 6,000 studies it could give people a little heads up or something? <laughs> Powerful industry. Right? Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker back in the 50s, on one hand you had all of society the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. Right? If you're even aware of studies like this. Well, let's fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. And of course, it's not just one study. Right? You put all the studies together. And the mortality from all causes put together, many of our dreaded diseases, significantly lower among those eating more plant-based. So instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits of the 50s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habits are not so good for you. So, what do you do? Do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the AMA went on record ref officially refusing to endorse it. Why? Could have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. OK, so we can see why the AMA was sucking up the tobacco industry. But wait a second, why weren't more individual doctors speaking up? Well, there were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries killing millions. But why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary disease. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the science, misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risk of secondhand smoke and toxic chemicals. Are the same hired by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy, and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Right? Whereas animal products and processed foods are wiping out at least 14 million people every year, those of us in this room involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution. We're talking about 14 million lives in the balance. So maybe plant-based eating should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. How long do we have to wait, though, before the CDC says, uh, don't wait for open-heart surgery, before starting to eat healthier as well? Until the system changes, 
we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. You know, Dr. Kim Williams I became president of the American College of Cardiology a few years ago. He was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients, strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. If there's one key element to my success in eating a plant-strong diet for all these years, it's my breakfast. I start every single day with Rip's Big Bowl cereal. It's a concoction that I created to fuel my performance as a professional triathlete going back 32 years. It's commercially available at Whole Foods Market or on Amazon, or you can make your own mixing a quarter cup of raw old-fashioned oats, a quarter cup Ezekiel 49 nuggets, a quarter cup bite-sized shredded wheat, and a quarter cup Uncle Sam's toasted cereal. After adding chia seeds and fruit, I then hose it down with oat milk. Lately, my big bowl has taken a turn for the better ever since the Nutra milk came into my life. It's a super efficient, high-speed blender designed to make alternative milks in less than two minutes. I take great pride in making my own oat milk now, and I can't believe how it's freshened up my breakfast bowl. You can grab one too. Visit thenutramilk.com and use the code PLANTSTRONG for a $50 discount and free shipping. I want to thank my co-creator of the podcast, Scott Battisill of 10% Media. Lori Kordowich, producer extraordinaire and director of Engine 2 Events. Amy Mackey, Engine 2's curator of creative content. Wade Clark with Bumble Media, our audio engineer. And Carrie Barrett for technical production. I have to thank my parents, Ann and Essie, who have been such guiding lights and inspirations over the years, as well as the great pioneers of this movement, who have been pushing this boulder up the mountain. As they say, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Remember, if you're digging the show, please rate us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, let me say, peace, engine two, keep it plant strong.